Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Laura Waller from UC Berkeley, and she explains how she got interested in electrical engineering. I spent a lot of like time with my dad fixing cars, fixing TVs, playing around with electronics. Um, and I really like that. What she enjoyed most about setting up her lab with new students. And I had such a great, great group of people and we were like having so much fun discussing ideas and, uh, and getting everything going. Uh, it was just like a really fun creative time, so. And her quite bizarre pastime of extreme reading. I always had papers with me because I was always like reading them when I was traveling and then I would just get people to take pictures of me reading them while I was in funny places. All in this episode of The Microscopist. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from University of York and on this episode of The Microscopist I'm joined by Laura Waller from the University of California, Berkeley. Laura, how are you today? Good, thanks. Well, thank you for joining me. Uh, I, I'm intrigued because you're not a classic microscopist. I think it'd be fair to say. <laughs> Am <Is> I? That... <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but I, so I, I know you uh, from an invitation you when you were speaking and invited keynote speaker for Carl Zeiss actually and talking about phase microscopy. How did you get into microscopy? Um, so in grad school, I was working in the lab of George Barbastathis at MIT. And uh, so his group at the time did a lot of um, nanophotonics and a little bit of microscopy. So he had worked on um, holographic data storage and had some ideas for using it for microscopy. So he was doing that already. Um, and then, so I was working in that sort of like the imaging side of the group, which wasn't very big at the time. Um, and then I don't exactly remember how I got into phase imaging. I think it was through this project that I was doing to try to image, um, image like the, the like clear membrane films that you put in fuel cells. And we were trying to image like humidity within these films, like in situ while yeah. it's in the fuel cell. And we were trying to do this with optics. So it's a humidity thing. So humidity is affects density and density is refractive index. So yeah. we were trying to do refractive index mapping, and I got into phase imaging. And then I was part of the Singapore MIT program um, in grad school. So I spent, I had to spend a couple months a year in Singapore. And uh, I was officially part of a center for environmental sensing, um, but Colin Shepard was working there and he was really fun. So I just hung out in his lab for a few months a year and he was doing lots of phase imaging. And I think that sort of uh, spurred it along as well. So that's how, the, that's how you got into the bio side. I presume then, when you're working in Canada. Yeah, I, yeah, it's definitely through Colin. What was it like in Singapore? Hot. Um, <laughs> no, Singapore was really fun. Um, it's a really cool place because it's so unique. Like it's in Asia, but it's pretty westernized. It's super clean and well regulated. I actually really liked the the whole like rules and and people following following what you're supposed to do everywhere. Um, yeah, and we, the Singapore MIT program was a great exchange program. I met a lot of great people. I'm still friends with some of the grad students from Colin Shepard's lab that I became friends with. And I had some friends in the program from MIT who would go over with me and we would just have fun traveling around Asia on the weekends. Um, so yeah, it was fun. Yeah, I'm glad you said traveling around Asia, not traveling around Singapore, because Singapore is pretty small. Yeah, that's right. So we did travel in Singapore probably the first weekend and then branched out to other parts of Asia. We learned to scuba dive in Vietnam. We went to Australia on the way once or Tokyo on the way once. We went to Malaysia. It was fun. So I guess that's one of the perks of being a student and studying is the ability to travel. Do you still travel a lot? Uh, take, taking COVID time out of the, the frame. Yeah, so pre-COVID, which was also pre-kids for me. I did travel a lot for conferences and such. Um, my husband's a management consultant, so he's traveling all the time. So I was kind of just like free to go whenever I wanted. And I did a lot of conferences in fun places and traveled around and 
uh, saw the world. I did that a lot in college as well. I also did an exchange program in undergrad at, in the UK at Cambridge University. So I really like traveling. Uh, and then COVID happened and I had kids and then now I don't travel very much <laughs> unless I have to. So yeah, so some people got COVID, you had kids, you, you, you got kids. That's it. Uh, yeah, I also got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so how old are your children now then? They're obviously quite young. Uh, three and one. So I think you sent me a picture. Yeah, there's a picture. Easy yeah, then. so that, the one-year-old was a little younger in that picture. That's at a birthday party. <laughs> so this is this is this is interesting. I've never really thought about this. Having children during COVID and working. Yeah. How did that? How did that balance? How did that? Was that was that actually a good um, thing? Was it hard? Was it harder? Was it easier? I think it was a good thing. So um, we, my my older son was six months old when COVID started, and we were working from home and it was really fun because you, you know, you take all your meetings on zoom and then have a 10 minute break. And instead of going for coffee with my colleagues, I would just go play trains with my son. Um, I got to see him a lot, have lunch with him. I think it was great to see him. Uh, okay. So we had, uh, we have a wonderful nanny who was taking care of him during the day and I have friends who lost their childcare and that was not fun. <laughs> um, but we didn't lose our childcare through COVID. And so it was actually really fun to just get to see the kids more. And then the second child was born during COVID. Um, and I, that was really great. I actually uh, had a much better maternity leave in that I just like would sign in and join the, whatever Zoom calls I was supposed to be on whenever I felt like it. Um, even when he was just like a week or two old, I was on Zoom just holding him, sleeping in my arms or nursing him. <laughs> um, and it was like, a, I kind of liked it to like stay a little bit involved in work as much as I wanted to be um, while also being able to just stop and take care of my baby when I felt like it or when, when I was tired, I could go and sleep. Um, I, I, I remember when we had young ones, I, I was four. So I, I, I stayed, it was my wife who took maternity leave and then went back part-time, not full-time uh, in that case. But I remember children actually when they're very young being quite easy. Because they sleep yeah. a lot. So during the working day, they're asleep quite a bit, so you can get bits done. How did you? So are you finding it more difficult now than you did through COVID? Um, no, uh, not really. Because they, well, they're still pretty young, but we uh, we still have good childcare, so I think that helps. And then uh, now it's a little bit harder because my husband's traveling a lot for work, so my nights and weekends I just don't have can't really work much because uh, I have the kids alone a lot on the on the nights um, so I'm really working fewer hours than I was before but I figure it's a good opportunity I want to see my kids grow up and in how many years will they not even want to see me anymore so <laughs> yeah. so I'm certainly working less now but it's fine it's uh it's enough to they're way too young to start thinking when when, when will they want shots of you way way too <laughs> they are way too young for that oh my three-year-old already tells me to go away sometimes <laughs> that's different <laughs> right uh i've got to i've got to ask looking at people is that a telescope behind you that's right that's a telescope uh from somebody gave that to us for our wedding um that's a pretty cool gift that's a a, a night sky so actually anyone who's listening so it's a, it's a an astronomy telescope not a bird watching telescope right yeah <laughs> so who's like the amateur astronomy, astronomy. Um, we haven't used it much uh, I haven't had much time to use it uh, so I've barely taken it out um, but uh, someday with my son we also have a project now to thinking about correcting aberrations for large aperture imaging system. So we might play around with it for that. <laughs> well, so, so that's interesting. So back onto the microscopy side then. And I, I saw that you're also, so obviously with, with phase imaging, you can do lensed phase imaging, but you can do lensless phase imaging as well. But I noticed, did I notice you're also working with cameras uh, as in photography type cameras for phase imaging? Yeah, so not so much for phase imaging, but like the lensless imaging, like our diffuser cam is just basically like a scattering element on a sensor, like you can just put scotch tape on a sensor. Um, and we've used that for microscopy, but it's much more simple setup when you use it for photography, 
because everything is in the far field. And so uh, you have simple Fourier transforms and things are more shift invariant system, lensless system. So yeah, we do stuff for photography and for microscopy. We also do x-ray microscopy and electron microscopy. We're pretty agnostic to the, the regime of electromagnetic waves um, and the size scales of things. And now we're like starting to think about things in, in space telescopes. So spanning the full pipeline of size scales. Oh, now you say space telescope. You also sent me this picture. This can't be related to that though, surely. This is not. This is this was something my husband really wanted to do, going on a zero gravity flight. This is his zero, I think it's called zero G. And this was his reward for a promotion that he got. And I didn't want to go. I was really scared to go. It's a plane that just sort of goes up and up and down and you get some weightlessness for like 40, 45 seconds, uh, maybe like 10 times over this course of the flight. Wow. And uh, I was super scared to go. And then I had a blast. Um, meanwhile, my husband, who's in the background there, he looks fine in that picture. He was just lying on the ground, trying not to barf the whole time. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. This was my extreme reading photo for it. I was trying to read a paper um, while in zero gravity. <laughs> so explain. So, so I've seen your website and as you say, Facebook for extreme reading, what explain where did this start and what is extreme uh, for those who obviously can't see what is extreme reading and where did it start uh so it was a play on i don't know if you remember a long time ago there was this thing called planking uh yeah. where oh, you yeah, just yeah. Like, straighten yourself straight as a board and take pictures in crazy places <clears throat> and then we saw like an extreme ironing thing where people were ironing on the top of a mountain or something like that and my my in-law, we were visiting Germany where my husband's from and my in-laws were making fun of me for carrying papers around everywhere we went because I I would print out papers and carry them around. And when I got a chance to read them, I would read them and then I could throw them out after I read them. And so uh, they took a picture of me reading a paper in front of the New Year's fireworks in Berlin. And that was the first one. And then I thought it was funny. So I started taking I always had papers with me because I was always like reading them when I was traveling and then I would just get people to take pictures of me reading them while I was in funny places <laughs> yeah so firstly I've got to just check this was during a firework display <clears throat> with your in-laws you chose to do some scientific reading yeah so okay there, there's the reason behind it I we were gonna babysit the nephews that night and so I yeah. brought a paper in case babysitting was boring <laughs> So, but then I happened to have it with me at New Year's at midnight during the fireworks. And the fireworks <laughs> were boring that you got the paper out. <laughs> right. <laughs> Basically. Oh, geez. And then so it just became a the thing. It's on my, I, it became a Facebook album and people kept giving me ideas of where I could do it, <laughs> do more extreme reading things. So you sent me some pictures of this. So, so first one, I, I so this, where, where yeah, this are is, you with this extreme reading? Uh, that's in Maui at the top of the, the big volcano in Maui. I think it's called Haleakala. That was before we did a 16 mile hike down the volcano. To, to count as extreme reading, do you have to have read the whole paper or did you just get it out I, and take a picture? Um, I do read the paper usually, but not always on the spot. <laughs> well, I, I it does have to be a real paper. So uh, I don't always read the whole paper in the event <laughs> so you also sent me this one which is right on a, this is on Lock Bash Mountain Disneyland uh I had a conference at Disneyland and I basically paid the entrance into Disneyland just so I could go and take this picture <laughs> <laughs> okay so this really is extreme this isn't just extreme reading this is extreme yeah. photography of you reading and and I had to pay the Splash Mountain people for this photo probably 20 bucks <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a very good picture for those who are listening you've got a child at the front looking fairly scared you've got two grown men with their arms in the air having a whale of a time someone in the middle who can't see quite well but laura sat at the back of this looking almost like she's lying back folding <laughs> legs reading a paper completely nonplussed by I, I presume the form that you are going down right now yeah, this 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 is a big drop in Splash Mountain ride at Disneyland. <laughs> and, and did the paper survive the splash? Uh, yes, this yeah, the Splash Mountain's not very wet. Okay, and <laughs> and then it gets more extreme, and now you are actually reading on an elephant while sitting on an elephant's knee. 
Uh, I don't remember. This was in Africa. It was like one of the things you could do while you were there. Um, what, read papers sitting on an elephant's knee? That, that's something you could... Yeah. I don't think many people have done that. <laughs> and then I, I think probably the most extreme, and this is a super cool picture. Where are you here? This is New Zealand uh, on an iceberg in New Zealand. It's one of these helicopter tours of the iceberg in New Zealand. It was a really beautiful place. Mm. Really cool. I have a lot of photos from this location. This is probably the coolest one in a, is, inside an ice cave. Yeah. So, so sort of, yeah, well, there you go. It's an ice cave that you're sat in, lying back, reading <laughs> uh, uh, quite clearly a scientific paper with images, with microscopy images by looks of it. <laughs> That's right. I don't remember which paper. Sometimes the papers are themed to go with the location, but sometimes they're just random. <laughs> I, 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 okay. I, yeah, I, I'm trying to think now when you've got fireworks, when you've got the ice cap, when you've got uh, <laughs> an elephant, how you are going to theme the paper that you are reading. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have, I can't remember any examples, but there were a few that were funny cho choices given the location. <laughs> so I'm going to encourage anyone listening to go and actually find the website for this, because <laughs> I, I have had a look at the website and you are even at your wedding. That's right. There's and everyone at our wedding knew, knew the joke. So it was just funny. <clears throat> uh, actually, that's people... how my husband proposed. So I don't know if you saw the proposal one, but. My husband proposed we were in front of a waterfall after a long hike and he asked someone to take a picture for, of me extreme reading and then he was proposing <laughs> while I was did extreme you, reading. Did you see him on his knee while you were reading or did you then move? Yeah, the yeah, that's what, like the photo is real. That photo is not, um, it's not uh, like staged or anything. <laughs> that was the oh, real no. proposal. <laughs> so he's all in on it as well. <laughs> I have a lot of support. <laughs> I'm kind of insulted you're not reading while whilst you're actually doing a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, I should be. You know, I don't print out papers anymore, and that's partly why I haven't done it so much anymore, because I read everything in PDF nowadays. <laughs> so you just need you just need the tablet. Just just Yeah. Yeah, it just well, doesn't I suppose feel the mostly same. it's on the phone as well now, isn't it? As well. So it doesn't Yeah. It doesn't feel the same to do that. Well, I suppose to Jenny. <laughs> oh. Any anyway, we we will move over from that side of it, from from the extreme thing you went you mentioned the, I, i'm fascinated by the photography side so i know it's microscopy what are the images i haven't actually seen any papers with the photography side what are the images of what information uh, what's the advantage oh, of it? just like people and stuffed animals and stuff like that so uh, a lot of the lensless imaging stuff we you know you just take a picture you just go out and take a picture a lot of it is students taking pictures of things they want to Okay, so, so why do it? Why remove the lens? What's the advantage? Uh, it's more compact and cheaper. And in fact, uh, so like lensless microscopy is always sold as, or lensless imaging is always sold as like compact and cheap. But if you think about like your iPhone camera is already pretty compact and very cheap. So it's like arguable um, what's useful there. I think... Um, so, so we, I even have a slide that's like cute, but what's it good for? Um, because lensless imaging um, is somewhat of a parlor trick in its like standard form. It's like cool that you can do it, but is it useful? But there's also been so many really interesting things that have come out of people trying to think about like, okay, it's not going to replace your iPhone camera maybe, but it can be useful for all these other things because it's different. So like, for example, um, you can make really like instead of having a really large telephoto lens that's super bulky and heavy and a humongous volume lens, you can make everything more compact and achieve similar things. Um, or what we've used it for a lot is um, exploiting compressed sensing. So this idea that like the point in your scene doesn't get imaged to a point on your sensor, it gets imaged to a whole 2D pattern. So it maps to a lot of different pixels and that's a multiplexing effect which can be exploited to use compressed sensing so that like if I delete some pixels, then I would still have information about that point because it mapped to a lot of different pixels. Mm -hmm. And so um, you can use this instead to, to leverage like 3D imaging or like higher dimensional imaging. So you take a 2D image and you reconstruct a 3D scene because of this multiplexing property, you can use compressed sensing to try to reconstruct more voxels than you measured pixels. 
So we've used it for a lot of compressed sensing examples for 3D imaging or hyperspectral, which is also 3D because it's XY lambda, or like ultra fast imaging with rolling shutters, which is a, just a neat idea of using the rolling shutter sp speed to get at um, higher, higher frame rates effectively. Yeah, and, and then when you go to the microscopy side, obviously you have the quantitative aspects as well. Yeah, so on the microscopy side, um, the way we've done this diffuser cam is basically, uh, so we've made a flat version. You can make a, a really flat camera, a really flat microscope. And this is useful for things like, so like we've been working with uh, neuroscientists at Berkeley who want to image brain activity in mice. And uh, so like when a neuron fires, you can have it, you can have a neuron light up when it fires. This is like optogenetics and related techniques where now it's all about voltage sensing. Um, so a neuron fires and it lights up, then it's so we're all about like trying to track which neurons lit up at which time. And this happens fast, like millisecond time scales. And it's in 3D. So you've got these points in 3D. So you don't have time or like the, you can't really like point scan very easily across like huge volumes with high resolution. Yeah. And so these like, like diffuser cam is a great way to get single shot 3D imaging if you just want to like detect and localize some points and then it's compact, right? So it's a flat cam that you can just mount on the head of these mice and they could run around without, um, without having a huge microscope attached. Which also but, presumably means the need for anesthetics is reduced as well. Um, yeah. So you, if you want, can do it on behaving mice that are running around, then yeah, there's, they don't need to be anesthetized. And then you can do all kinds of different experiments. So like our collaborative study, say the cortex, which controls a lot of like motor and visual um, stuff. And so you can, you can like see what happens in the brain as you feed them visual cues or as you feed them like motor cues, like running around on a ball or something like that. So I mean, oh no, no, I was gonna say this is mind blowing stuff, but actually having just talked about the mice, that is not the best term to use. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but it, it is highly complex stuff from a, from the maths perspective and even just thinking about how to actually execute uh, the application it, it's not trivial or you, you make it sound easy you make it sound like the camera is really basic and actually it, it's it's still clever to get it to do what it's going to do but then the application side how how important are the are collaborations to developing your research in different directions yeah, it's pretty essential in most of what we do. Um, and I would say like, we go about research in a little bit different way than than like biologists or NIH would expect. They like hypothesis driven research, like here's a problem, I'm going to be an engineer and figure out how to solve it. Whereas we're like, oh, cool, I can put scotch tape on a sensor and make this camera. What is it good for? And then we go looking for like customers. Um, and, it, and that way works too. So but it means that we have to do a lot more like like sort of like what's the like beating the pavement to try to find the right customers so I do a lot of talking to people trying to find collaborators who can use the kind of stuff we're doing and then maybe we modify it or change the design or come up with new ideas based on what their particular application space problems are but yeah particularly like all the neuroscience work we do has to be in collaboration we don't have mice in our lab we don't know anything much about actual neuroscience so um, that's a collaboration and it's a wonderful collaboration. And then a lot of the biology work we do, even like phase imaging and cell imaging um, is in collaboration with, with people who want to use the devices and talking to them and understanding what they want from their imaging systems. But I really enjoy working with other people, so it's fun. How easy is it? How, how easy do they find grasping the concept of what you're talking about to start with when you, when you approach um, I think it's fairly easy to explain that we can take these pictures and they contain information about 3D or something. And then, then people can just sort of think of it as magic, how you reconstruct the image, which oh, in some cases, if you, if you use black box neural networks, it kind of is magic. So um, I like are to say it's skeptical? science, not magic. <laughs> so, sorry, Lou. Uh, are they skeptical of uh, to thinking, oh, I, yeah, I am, and I, I, do you meet any mm. resistance, skepticism of the technique no. compared to confocal or something? I don't think so, no. I think most people are, if you show them 
something related, they can believe that it will work for their application. So, oh, I, I say so this is the whole technology. I, I know holography has been around for some time, but it, this is a very rich period. It's a, it's a computers are caught up. It's enabling you and others to do so much more than could just couldn't be done before. So when you were going to university, you could never have even known that these sort of things existed. So I'm going to take you back now to maybe when you were 10, 11, 12. <laughs> Do you remember what the first job is that you actually wanted to be when you were young? Uh, I think when I was really little, I think I wanted to be a lawyer, but I'm not totally sure. I don't remember that well. <laughs> I, can I ask why? Why a lawyer? I have no idea. <laughs> this was like, you know, everyone's always asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think that was my standard answer. But I don't know why, because I didn't know any lawyers. And so I don't know why I would have wanted to be that. I probably saw a TV show or something. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And so what, what moved you into, was it electronic engineering you studied? Yeah. So in high school, I was doing lots of things and I was really excited about lots of topics. Um, my dad was a computer programmer, but he was really like an electronics tinkerer. So he had our basement was he was a hoarder and our basement was like an electronics hoarder lab that was just like people would bring him broken TVs and stuff. And this was back in the day when TVs were simple enough that somebody at home could actually fix one. And so I spent a lot of like time with my dad fixing cars, fixing TVs, playing around with electronics. Um and I really liked that. So when I finished high school, I remember I was deciding between going into going to university for English or engineering, electrical engineering. That's a big and difference. Yeah, I couldn't decide. I didn't really know the difference. I don't remember. I think I just decided I liked engineering better. And then my uncle had gone to MIT and I had seen like a, a show about the the robot competition there. There was like a Lego robot competition at MIT. And I thought that seemed like a really cool place full of only engineers that like to do fun things like build robots. And so I just really wanted to go to MIT and I did um, against my parents' wishes because it was much more expensive for them than some of the Canadian universities that I could have went to. Um, yeah, but it served you well. Right. Yeah. So it was, it was a wonderful experience and I'm glad that I chose that. I think sometimes, uh, if you can afford something, it's worth it to pay more for what you really want instead of settling. So, so that's that's where you how, how you fell into engineering. But I, I, yes, I know you're an engineer, but so much is around the maths uh, of the problems of it. So, what would you class yourself as? Uh, definitely engineer. So, um, yeah. in fact, I would say I'm not that good at math. Uh, <laughs> I'm. I, I like the engineering piece of it. I like the creative ideas part of engineering. Um, and um, I also like the technical part of it, uh, but especially after being an advisor for so long and I don't get to like write code myself or do the math myself as much. Um, I definitely identify more as like the engineer. I like thinking about problems, solving problems, thinking of new ideas. Because the, obviously the computer science side is, is a big component. So how do I, how big a lab do you have? How many how many staff, PhD, postdocs do you have in your lab? Um, so now it's about twelve or thirteen. Uh, we just had eight students graduate in the spring, which is a crazy turnover. Yeah. Um, but I'm not. So my lab was over twenty people, and it was like too much. I can't keep up with everyone, and I can't uh, like keep on top of what everyone's doing very well. And so then people were working on things that I didn't fully understand, and I don't like that. So um, I'm just trying to make the group a little smaller so I can manage it better. And what, the, what, what sort of skill sets do they all, are they on the same skill sets? Or do they have different skill sets that are in your lab? Uh, no, they're all over the place. So people in my group come from backgrounds in signal processing, machine learning, optics, physics, uh, bioengineering. We have a really broad spread. And I think that's a huge benefit. In fact, that's why I want to keep the group big enough to keep a good spread of skill sets and interests and topics in the group. And I think that the inter interdisciplinariness um, is really great for the group. I think everyone learns a little bit of the other parts that they don't know. So when students come in with a really strong background in optics, but not in the machine learning algorithm side of things, then they'll, I will like make them take classes in 
in algorithms or signal processing so that they can sort of like catch up in that space. And when people come in like pure signal processing algorithms, people, they have to do some experimental stuff so that they can learn some optics as well, because that's really the heart of computational imaging is that you have like the same person designing both the optics and the algorithms and not like one for each, but the same person doing both. And so obviously people are going to have some strengths in one versus the other, but I think it's really valuable for um, for people to understand both sides of it, even if it's sort of disparate from what their background was. And just listening to all the different backgrounds, there was no hardcore biologist there, life mm -hmm. scientist. No, we just collaborate with the hardcore the collaborations. No, Certainly just... some of my bioengineering students know biology yes. much better than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so carrying on a little bit, it's not just phase imaging. You're also involved with super res microscopy as well. So what are you doing in that area? Um, yeah, so, well, that came from, uh, we started doing this Fourier tachography, which is phase retrieval plus synthetic aperture to get super resolution. So you end up with really large space bandwidth product, meaning like lots of pixels resolved, like up to a gigapixel resolved just by coating your illumination light. Um, it's conceptually quite a bit like structured illumination, which is a super resolution method. And we're doing some structured illumination mm -hmm. stuff. We have a cool project doing, um, it's like fixed speckle structured illumination and your samples like moving underneath it. And you just use the motion of the sample to do this spec speckle structured illumination for super resolution. Um, so that's, you can do that with fluorescence microscopy or, or like as a coherent method. So we do both coherent methods and fluorescence incoherent methods. And in fact, like one of our specialties is, is knowing how to model partial coherence so that you can sort of have the whole spectrum of coherent to incoherent. Um, it's, I, I, I'll ask after, because obviously I'm, I'm going to get too specific if I start asking about the fluorescence side of it and, and how that works. Because I, I, you know, it's not often I'm stumped, but actually that's um, a... So the fluorescence stuff, we do a lot of it. So it started out from this diffuser cam ideas, which is all, um, everything is linear in intensity. So it's phase doesn't really matter other than there's a phase mask in there, um, but you measure intensities and you solve based on intensities. So uh, yeah, so that didn't really have much to do with phase. So a lot of the fluorescence, the 3D fluorescence imaging doesn't need phase, but actually I'm really excited about some stuff right now with like combining 3D phase imaging with 3D fluorescence imaging because the 3D phase map is basically your 3D refractive index map, which is the scattering potential of the sample. And so you can digitally remove all yeah, okay. scattering if you can measure 3D refractive index accurately across the whole sample, which is hard because it's a lot to measure. Uh, yeah, I, I was just thinking, I can see exactly where it's going, but it's the maths to, <laughs> to get it right. and. The size right, of the data. Yeah. The size so, of the data would be huge. Yeah. And like writing out math for the forward model is not so hard. It's the inverse problem has exponentially more degrees of freedom as you scatter deeper and deeper into the sample. And so that's the hard part, really. Um, and I think that's where like a lot of these machine learning methods have been super valuable because they can they can approximately or even exactly solve really high dimensional non-linear, non-convex optimization problems, which is exactly what this kind of thing is. Okay. So I am going to move, I, I get off the, 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 the detail bits because I'm getting too geeky on it. And I, <laughs> yeah, I want to know more. Uh, I'm going to ask now a, a different question. You're still really young, but you must have a favorite publication that you've either authored or co-authored. Uh, oh. What is your favorite publication for whatever reason? Um, well, I'm not that young, <laughs> um, but probably, I, I hate to say, because then I'm like insulting the people who are on other papers. <laughs> I don't know. So, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you go for two then. Oh, that could actually be more insulting, couldn't it? Yeah, that doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll just go back really far of the, the favorite paper to write or the favorite paper to, like that we came up with was in not necessarily the most useful or like the best technique was um, when I was in grad school and we figured out a way to use chromatic aberrations to get phase images. And it was really cool because you could just use a bad microscope objective and take a color image and then reconstruct phase from it. And it was just like single shot phase imaging 
it was using like it's like it's not a bug it's a feature type approach yeah. which I really love and it worked really well it was like one of these examples of a project that like I just tried it for fun and it worked the first time which was actually like not a blessing because then when I tried to replicate it later somewhere else it didn't work and I didn't know why because I didn't understand the system very well because it had just worked the first time I did it um, but it was really fun and uh, when it worked was when I, I was working with some folks at Boston Micro Machines in Boston they make MEMS mirrors for adaptive optics and they're a really fun group of people and I was using one of their mirrors as my like phase object and like this thing just worked and I was able to map out the surface shape of their mirror really accurately from a, a bad microscope objective. Uh, and they were really excited about it and I was really excited about it and we were all just like, I can't believe this worked. This is really cool. So that was just fun in the like seeing a new idea come to fruition and be useful quickly. And then the paper was fun to write because it was like, guess what? Aberrations can be good. And I just love that kind of like opportunistic imaging approach to things. <clears throat> so this, this might be, I, I, it may be a different answer. It may be the same answer. In your career to date, what has been your favorite period of time? Or most oh, of time? Um, definitely like a few years into my faculty job. So like once my lab was up and running and I had equipment, then I had like all these awesome students working on all these ideas that I'd been thinking about for a long time. And like, they were doing stuff, like when they started doing stuff on their own, the first couple of years is like all investment. You're just teaching them stuff and getting things started. And then when they start like doing things on their own and coming up with their own ideas and getting really cool results without you, that was just really exciting. And I had such a great, great group of people and we were like having so much fun discussing ideas and, uh, and getting everything going uh, it was just like a really fun creative time so so you have all that it was quite interesting you said that time investment to get them up and running and you know, you say, you say okay, give some of your expertise to enable them to progress what you want them to progress forward with and then they become self-sustaining they, they, they become standing up by themselves and they can move forward with such a high flux <clears throat> so you just had that big turnover uh of, of eight going Right. Do you have to put so much time investment in yourself now or is there enough sort of um, knowledge within the team that can keep sort of feeling? So, you know, the um, most senior lab members, are they now doing a lot of that teaching? Yeah, so that's the beauty. Once your lab gets going, then the more senior people can teach the more junior people and get them going. So, yeah, so we still have some people that are like helping the new people start. I'm also teaching a grad seminar on computational imaging this semester, which is super helpful. So like the new students can take that and get a great like intro, intro to all the papers you're supposed to read and all the like main ideas of the field. Um, so that's super helpful. But yeah, I am spending more time, I think, with students this this year because I have new people and there's less older people to guide them. How, how, what's the longest period of time you've had a member of your team? Oh, I don't know, because I have had, I've had a couple of grad students who started as undergrads, like started like sophomore year in undergrad or so. So we're probably around eight years or so. And still there. Sorry? And still with you at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the one I'm thinking of just graduated, but I have two more that just are halfway, partway through a PhD after working as undergrads for a couple of years. <laughs> okay. So, and... and Actually, it must be daunting to lose someone who's been there for eight years. It's, it's good to see them fly, but at the same right. time, they're an asset to the lab. Right. It's it's just when you want to keep them the most is when they want to leave. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I guess where that's where career postdocs kind of <laughs> just to keep one or two to keep that legacy, to keep that knowledge base to can go, can be really useful. Uh, so we've asked about the best times, favorite publication. What about uh, the most challenging time, most difficult time you've had in your career? Uh, good question. I'm not really sure. I guess like probably like now or until recently, like I found having kids is such a bomb on your time, <laughs> sucking all your time away. And so uh, I found that really hard in terms of like my career of like trying to balance should I go to this conference or should I stay home with my kids? Should I like when I'm like my maternity leave was very wishy-washy. It was like sort of like do whatever you want. And so, you know, like, 
should I like be enjoying this time with my kids and just stop doing work for a long time? Or should I, should I like do as much as I chose the option of like prioritize my kids for a couple of months when they were born, but also be, if I'm available, then do stuff for work and try to keep up with my students. So I'm not, you know, ruining their lives by not filling in forms and such. Um, but I found, I, I really find that like balancing of work life when you have kids is really hard. Um, and all the, all of the, uh, how do I say it? Like all of the gendered crap that comes with <laughs> having kids and being in academia, I find extremely frustrating. Just like a, a lot of like, uh, things that, that, uh, are very gendered that really bother me. And I, I waste my time thinking and complaining about them. <laughs> so I, I presume it's got more challenging now that you are back at work. Um, I, yeah, sorry, yeah. Now back, that I'm as in the office is back and it's not all virtual anymore. Yeah, although I have also been appreciating going back to campus, um, to the office is sort of like really like getting out of the house is a real escape from from all the domestic things and you can focus a little bit better sometimes. But it's also really hard to like, you know, you have to be home at a certain time. You can't start, you can't just wake up early and do something so easily. So uh, yeah, that's been harder to like have to work within a more restrict time frame. I'm going to throw some quick fire questions at you next. Sure. So, first one is PC or Mac? <laughs> PC, but it has an Apple sticker on it. So... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop the quick fire question. Why has he got an Apple sticker on your PC? Because uh, my husband has the same one and I need to be able to distinguish them. <laughs> of all the stickers in the world, you chose an Apple sticker. Yeah, I like my iPhone, so I still like Apple. Okay. <laughs> okay, so PC or Mac? PC. McDonald's or Burger King? Disgusting, both. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you were to get a takeaway, what would you go for? Actually, in, in Europe, McDonald's is pretty decent. The McCafe is actually not bad. <laughs> Sorry, what was the next question? I missed oh, it. Yeah, so if you to have a takeaway, uh, you're right, actually. Uh, the the McCafe is actually not too bad at all. Uh, if you were to have a takeaway of any sort, what would you choose? A takeaway? Uh, a, a take home. Uh, fast food. Oh, um, Thai Pizza, food. Chinese, Indian, Mexican. Yeah, Thai food. We always get Thai food takeout. Okay. Uh, lens or lensless? <laughs> uh, lensless because it's more fun. <laughs> okay, phase or fluorescence? Oh, both. <laughs> so, I have a three-year-old. I know the answer. You can the answer to an or question can be both. <laughs> okay, coffee or tea? Coffee for sure. <laughs> Long or short? What are you referring Espresso to? Espresso or Americano or latte? Or... Oh, um, cappuccino. Okay. Beer or wine? Uh, wine. Red or white? <laughs> white. Uh, chocolate or cheese? Oh, chocolate for sure. <laughs> milk or dark? Um, milk. Milk chocolate in America? Oh, yeah. I like sugar. <laughs> uh what what is your favorite food like oh my favorite food uh ice cream <laughs> okay and what about for a main course if you'd go to a conference and they were to serve you a dinner because quite often you don't get a choice and if you're a guest speaker right. um, you get taken somewhere and they'll put something down what would be the oh, great choice like ravioli or some pastas probably. okay Converse to that, what would be the worst thing that they could put in front of you? Oh, seafood. And it, I remember when I was interviewing at Berkeley, they take me, they took me to the like seafood restaurant in town, and it's the only thing that I don't eat is seafood. <laughs> and it was Ooh. fine. They also had other food, so it was fine. But uh, it was a funny story. I now I've been to a conference, and I, I'm going to be very careful what I say because they'll probably be listening who who organised it. <laughs> And we went out and it was to an island and it was it was shellfish only. And <laughs> two very thin slices of bread. And at a conference dinner with all the free drink, there was only two slices of thin bread that I could eat. 
the rest was <laughs> yeah I, I i'm not I, I i did do some lobster but the rest of the crabs and shrimps everything else <laughs> everyone around me loved me because <laughs> everyone was getting more portion size but, yeah um, or just... um sometimes in like in singapore i would often go to restaurants and say like is there seafood in that and they would say no just shrimp <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of the ones I struggle most with. I, I can do some fish, but anyway, uh, <laughs> that's just a good example of, of, of a good thing. Are you an early bird or a night owl? Uh, definitely an early bird. I and is that out it. of choice, or that's because you're younger and wakes up at five in the morning? No, I've always been an early bird. I've always woken up early and go to bed early. I sleep a lot, but I do it like nine to five usually. Okay, and. I, I, oh, this is going to be a daft question in light of the extreme reading book or tv <laughs> uh oh i don't really read books though i i do read journal papers but um okay. yeah we don't have a tv we just have like netflix on our ipad projector okay so if you're into netflix what's your netflix vice what is your, your the, the, the worst oh. binge on netflix it's not Netflix, but I watch Dateline, which is everyone makes fun of me for, but it's, it's relaxing. It's a nice like background show. <laughs> and what is Dateline for? Us oh, Dateline's like a, it's an American, it's not news, but it's about like murder. It's like real life murders. So like how they solved the murder of some person who killed their wife or something like that. <laughs> okay. I always worry about people who watch something like that and kind of, surely it's just planning ahead. That's what, yeah, that's what my husband says. He's always making fun of me. Um, but I don't know why I like it. I just do. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite film? Um, oh, the classic. We used to, we didn't have a TV growing up, but we were allowed to watch, like we had a VCR and we would watch The Sound of Music like over and over and over again. Um, and that was one of my life's dreams. Was I went to all the locations of Sound of Music while I was in Austria. And I was traveling with a friend who had never seen the movie and he was just annoyed because I was like, oh my gosh, that's the gone, that's the pergola that they danced under. <laughs> and we traveled around in Salzburg and saw all the sites. So you didn't watch TV, but you had a VCR and your dad fixed TVs for everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we didn't have cable. So like we had a TV, but no content other than some oh, okay. VHS tapes. <laughs> And to, to, actually, on that, so you've been to Austria, of all the places in the world that you've been to, what's your favourite country? Oh, that's or a place. Favorite. I think my favourite place is Hawaii. I just love going there. It's, so, it's always beautiful. Weather's always great. There's lots to do. So you can visit Holly Aaron when she's built, finished, finalised right. in your house. Okay, yeah, go sure. to Hollywood. She's <laughs> over there. Uh, what about, do you have a favourite Christmas film? Christmas film, um, Miracle on 34th Street. <laughs> okay. And it, I, I, it'll be interesting to see what that answer is in a few years when your children start watching Christmas films and the same That's thing right. over and over <laughs> and over <Loving> again. Disney. <laughs> uh, what about what type of music are you into? What you um, I still listen to the music that I listened to in college. So in college, I listened to like whatever was was hip back then. But then, but then I never really like came with the times forward. So my iPod is still um, things like No Doubt and Gwen Stefani and uh, what else? I don't even know what else. Like like you two, my we've taught my my three year old. He can sing the entirety of Rocket Man, uh, and we listen to a lot of Beatles. So his name is Jude, like the Hey Jude Beatles song and. So he listens to a lot of Beatles and I'm starting to get into that. I did, no <laughs> doubt. 96-ish, like, 90, 90, mid-90s for that, a lot of that music. Well, so no doubt. Yeah, I was born in 81, so okay. I was a teenager in the 90s. Yeah, it has. Just, just <laughs> thinking about, I, I find it really good, actually. I, music takes me back to particular places. So things like No Doubt, I know where I was listening to it. Right, Fox, different or special, so it places a time and a date and a yeah. It, no doubt, it's probably high school. Call, I just can't think of yeah. Yeah, I, I, I Scottish holiday for me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> a, a bit different. Okay, yeah. Now what I listen to is my son listens to the asks for the Beatles all the time, or Beatles or Coco Melon. So <laughs> Coco Melon is like really annoying kids songs. <laughs> well, at least the Beatles aren't so bad. 
that, that, that's, that's that, 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 the Beatles are good. No, it's not so bad, not so, even good. Okay, so I've asked you about uh, your favorite place, so Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I've asked you what you wanted to be when you were young, what you are today. We know where, where you are today and how you got there. If you could do any job in the future, even if it was just for a day or a week or a year, what job would you like to sample? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I'll uh, give you a couple if you can't make a decision on one. Yeah, give me some choices <laughs> and choose. Yeah, you're good. You're good, you're good. I, there's so many jobs out there, but you know, sometimes you look at the, oh, I'd love to know what it's like to work in that environment for a short period, whether I could hack it in that environment or how much fun it would really be to be in that environment. Yeah. Yeah, maybe like... Uh, like being in movies would be cool to see how they're made or uh i don't know that's a good answer i think uh, yeah uh, I think uh, movie would it be a like, murder film yeah sure <laughs> or maybe like yeah like working in like seeing how restaurants are run or something would be fun okay. um or maybe like yeah like flying planes or like uh yeah, something the, the like fun, like running a roller coaster or something. <laughs> the, the, the responsibility of flying a plane, that would be pretty scary, I think. That, that, that's a lot. Yeah, of I don't think I'd want to do that just for a day, though, right? Because you wouldn't have the training. <laughs> yeah, but you can assume you get 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 a feel for it. I, I think the acting is quite... I, I like the, the acting answer. I think that's quite good. And the restaurant, yeah, can you hack it? You yeah. know, it's quite intense. You know, could you get those skills to be... You know, so Gordon Ramsay wouldn't shout at you. You know, yeah. I guess that'd be the challenge, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, I just see how they organize everything. I'm always amazed the logistics uh, run smoothly. Well, maybe we should all do that and then run our labs like it. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just put the shit. Oh, that's what you're doing today. Go, bring it through. Yeah. Uh, move, moving on. Have you? Ha who have been your inspirations in your life? Oh, like general inspirations. Yeah, I actually general, have. A, yeah, yeah go, I have go, like go, a thing. I have a thing that I don't like to idolize people. I don't think it's good for anybody to like, you know, like to to idolize Einstein as like the genius and everything he did was perfect because he was the world's genius. I think it's better to take piece different pieces from different people. So like maybe like scientifically, Einstein is wonderful. Um, or like I always liked Tesla because he was uh, inventing all of this stuff and 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 uh, fighting on like electricity standards and I just thought he was an interesting character um but that's like scientifically and then like uh I have like my some of my family like I have some aunts that I really respect like morally or like thinking about uh being a good person type uh is it so like different people that I might that I might respect there and but, you never um, know inspirations yeah, yeah and then like my mentors have certainly been inspiring scientifically. Uh, I I worked with George Barbastathis in grad school, and then I did a postdoc with Jason Fleischer at Princeton, and both of them were great advisors uh, in different ways. And it was really it was really awesome to like to see all the the good pieces of how they run labs and try to pick up on those. Um, and then when I started my faculty job, I had a lot of senior colleagues who helped me get started, or like. I like admired the way they ran their labs and tried to copy it. I had a, a mentor, Andy Newrider, who was, he was just, he was officially retired from Berkeley, but he really just like spent a lot of time helping me get started and was like such a good mentor and a wonderful example of, uh, I think like being both, he was like the king of lithography and everybody knew him in lithography and he was very successful in that, in his scientific space, but he was like the nicest person ever and would like, like he brought me a Swiffer because he thought my floor needed to be, I was complaining about my floor needing sweeping. Just sort of like great example of a humble, nice, wonderful person who was also very successful scientifically. And uh, I think that there's a few examples of that in, in my senior colleagues that have been really like inspiring to me to try to uh, be as good as you can and be be good at science and be good at a good person. <laughs> I shouldn't take a mouth from that moment. Uh, <laughs> I have. Uh, what What are you like as a supervisor? What am I like? 
Yeah, are you, are no, you like, it's a lot of freedom or you're someone who micromanages or in the middle? What would you say your yeah. management feels like? I think I'm super fun. Um, so, no, I'm so, sort of, I, I think like my personality is in the middle that like when I started, I was more, I spent a lot of time with students. So I don't micromanage ever. So I, people would say they have lots of freedom, but the more time I spend with them, the more I can influence what they're doing. So when I have a smaller group, I have, I think more influence on like people are working on things more that are like what I wanted them to work on, but not because I forced them to more that I convinced them to. Um, and when my group was bigger, I was just like too hands off that I didn't even know what some people were working on properly or like wasn't keeping up with it. And mm -hmm. so what I want to be is somewhere in the middle where like, you know, new students get lots of attention and I can influence what they're working on and like, you know, be really close to what they're working on. And then like, as they get more senior, they should be able to be more independent, but also still have a chance to like talk to me and I can appreciate things. So I would say like more on the hands-off style, but trying to be involved. I want to be hands-off, but it really involved, which is, would be the ideal. And I'm trying to get my group to a size that I can do that okay. adequately. <laughs> we are coming up to the hour, but I'm going to ask you, what do you see as the biggest limiting factors at the moment that limits research and the speed of research? Or in, um, in for me, it's time. Reason? I run out of time. <laughs> I don't have time to do everything I would like. Uh, I do think like science has and research have lots of outdated ways of doing things like the peer review system is kind of silly. There's a lot of things that could be fixed there, um, but it's going to be a lot of work to do that. And what we're doing has reasons why we do it. Uh, but I think people being competitive is a really big problem. And I don't like that. Uh, this like holding your ideas, scientific ideas, secrets, like science is for the world. It's to be shared. It's to make the world better. And I think secret secretiveness and competitiveness in science is really dangerous and really bad for science. And mm -hmm. if we would all just collaborate instead of competing, we could probably do a lot more better science faster. No, I, I think that's a really good point, and, and I, I would I, I agree, actually, <laughs> fully with that. I can understand why competition is there, I, as in I can understand why people are competitive. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a shame way if someone else is working by coincidence on something very similar or the same. Would it not actually help if they just joined up? And right. I, I, um, my group has done this a few times, actually, uh, with other groups, and it's been very fruitful because each group has a different take on it. Um, yeah. And the other problem that I worry a lot about is diversity, that diversity and inclusion. So um, particularly in like optical physics, we are not very good at it and we need to we need to do better and do more. And we need I think in particular, we need everyone on board. Um, and I, I worry about like all the backlash to diversity efforts. That's really dangerous for science. I, I, so I, I saw some of your lab pictures. So I haven't got them here, but I, on the website, you've got your lab photos and stuff. It actually look pretty diverse. Yeah, my group is, I think it's about half women and we have um, some underrepresented minorities, not maybe not fully represented. And we have some first generation college students. We have a good mix of different different cultures and, and different uh, backgrounds. So I think it's great that my group is like that. And uh, I mean, I still just choose the best people. I just have a, I think I have a, a better chance to get some of the best people who are diverse because we have a great culture around that. So um, I, I really worry that science is missing out on a lot of really awesome people because they were not making them feel welcome enough. Yeah, and I think maybe, uh, yeah, the, thought processes that there's one thing being well educated is another one having freedom of thought and being able yeah. to think radically and i think you're right uh, on that side that people can bring very radical new innovative thinking to that yeah, yeah there's a lot of me. research there's a lot of research that more diverse groups come up with better ideas and and work better together and yeah. so there's there's lots of like reasons why why we should be more more like cognizant of of keeping a diverse group of people so as we come up to the hour i have to i have to i haven't asked you about what other hobbies you have outside of <clears throat> your children and extreme reading so what hobbies do you do to relax maybe you don't get much time to do them at the moment but maybe you do 
So what are your favorite hobbies? Yeah, with little kids, it's all gone. <laughs> I don't have time to relax ever. Um, but actually, they're pretty fun. So uh, we like to take them to the zoo. And we've been to Disneyland already. Or uh, we go to like the roller coaster park around here, Six Flags, um, for fun. But before kids, I had lots of hobbies. In uh, I did a lot of hiking. Um, I still like hiking sometimes. I used to play soccer. I played soccer in college and high school. Um, and I played for a while as an adult as well. Um, I'm so you were in the get... varsity football team? Sorry? The... You were in the varsity football team at one point? Yes, I was on the MIT varsity, football, varsity soccer team, yes. And at Cambridge, I played soccer as well in my exchange program year. Um, yeah, so uh, Bay Area is so wonderful for hiking. So that's always been a big one. I used to travel more. Um, I like traveling uh seeing new places um what other hobbies uh not really much else I hang out with my friends um, with a glass of white wine and chocolate <laughs> that's and right yeah <laughs> and certainly like I love my work and so some of my hobbies were like building silly optics things <laughs> or playing with optics toys and demos you can see some of that on my website on the uh I think it's called optics fun or something yeah yes i and i have seen it with different illusions and other bits and right, pieces yeah. as well on there uh, we are up to the hour so i'm just gonna just just one final final question <laughs> is your garage or basement or whatever you have do you have a load of just electronic dumped gear in there no so you can keep no so one of the side effects of having a Hoarder as a parent is I am extremely clean and I like to I love to get rid of stuff and my house is very neat and tidy and we only have things that we use. <laughs> okay. Laura, thank you so much for joining me today. Everyone who's listened to the microscopy today, thank you for listening. Please don't forget to subscribe. And you've heard lots of different people mentioned throughout this podcast. But Laura, thank you so much. Keep on doing the great work. <laughs> After this, stay on because I've got lots of questions <laughs> that have been more okay. So Laura, thank you. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.